Welcome to Be Informed, Be Well with John Malanka, episode 38, The Cannabis Industry in the Global Economy with Michael Patterson. Hey everybody, just finished a great podcast. It's a little longer one than normal, but it was a fun podcast with a uh, uh, Florida-based uh, gentleman by the name of Michael Patterson. Uh, he's the CEO of U.S. Cannabis Pharmaceutical Research and Development, LLC, also known as U.S. Cannabis. Uh, he shared what they're doing here in the United States, but what they're doing overseas as well. And he has one of the first legal grows of THC, surprisingly, THC in, in Africa and how they're exporting that, growing that, exporting that to uh, countries like Germany as well as Australia. And what he sees for the global market of cannabis, hemp and CBD and what he sees what's happening here in the United States as well. So uh, enjoy it. He, you'll, you'll love his energy and uh I certainly enjoyed it. So thanks for being on, Michael, and we'll get you back on the show. But uh, send your comments, like us uh, if you do like us, uh, but also subscribe. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. And all of its hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPGCBD for 20% off. Welcome back, everybody. This is John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This next guest, you're going to love his energy. Uh, Michael Patterson. Hey, Michael, how are you doing? How you doing, John? I'm excited, to have... excited to be on your show. I, I know, man. We've been talk. We've been talking for 45 minutes before I know. the show we get... on live. So Let me you're, tell you, you're... when I talk about weed and cannabis yeah. and hemp and CBD, it's like the, the minutes turn into hours. It's just great. I love it. Well, we're here. We'll we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, get going, and and uh, hopefully it doesn't get dark behind you, huh? No, uh, it shouldn't. I got my plants right there. So this is that. one of our I facilities in Lesotho, or Lesotho, which is a country inside of South Africa. South Africa. So, so it's landlocked. It it is landlocked. So we'll go into all that, and and I want to talk about uh, CBD and THC and the hemp sure. market, not only here but overseas, and. Uh, uh, so first off, your bio, um, uh, Michael Patterson, he's the CEO of the U.S. Cannabis Pharmaceutical Research and De Development, LLC. It's a U.S. cannabis uh, company, correct? A U.S.-based company, yes. U.S.-based company. It's a privately held developmental consulting firm, which is, was established in 2014 with the mission of moving society forward through legalized cannabis. U.S. cannabis develops the legal cannabis hemp CBD markets globally across all platforms from education, cultivation, product uh, production, dispensing research and development management operations and compliance and physician services, which is so needed. So we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, U.S. cannabis currently, currently works with national, state and local governments, sovereign nations and public and private companies in all aspects of cannabis, hemp, CBD industry throughout the United States and globally. So uh, welcome, Michael. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Well, cool. So you've had, uh, so let me ask you, you're in Florida. You're from North Carolina. Um, That's my southern twang. It's not from Alabama. It's not from Alabama. It's, 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 not it's Alabama. A, okay. Won't, won't confuse that. Sure. Um, but uh, uh, how'd you get into this? Because I know your background is healthcare. You, mm -hmm. you ran a few uh, nursing homes, which is... Uh, pretty strict uh, um, regulations, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I know my, one of my best friends just put, I say just put, how awful is that? His mother is in a nursing home right now and uh, very happy at first. It was kind of kicking his scream. Yes. I was more kicking his scream, like, how could you put your mom there? And said, no, it, it'll be, a, you know, she Trust me, she I, I did a lot of counseling for families mm -hmm. and, and the guilt trip. And so I used to uh, run a, an all Alzheimer's nursing home yeah. and actually worked in one. So my background is occupational therapy. I'm a licensed occupational therapist and nursing home administrator in four states. And so I came through the healthcare route. So yeah. I uh, actually moved to Florida when I, right when I graduated, I was a traveling occupational therapist and I started in nursing homes and I didn't, I never really been in nursing homes. And yeah. uh, I, for some reason, I really took to it. I enjoyed it. 
Um, it takes a special person to work in a place where you see a lot of death and dying. But one of the things I learned is that about 30 to 40 percent of the people are short term rehab where they come in with a hip fracture, knee replacement, a stroke, and then they end up going back home. So definitely learned a lot. I moved my way up into running nursing homes. So I used to run. I was a chief operating officer of a company called Avante Group. And so we had 20 nursing homes from New Jersey through to Florida. We did about 230 million in total sales. And uh, a couple of things that I learned being in the nursing home industry, I learned a lot about regulation and I learned a lot about litigation. So we typically- Regulation and litigation? And litigation. So we had, we got sued all the time. Yeah. So it was anything and everything. And so I've learned a lot about risk management, uh, compliance. And so um, my background was literally perfect for cannabis, but the, really the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And so I can tell you now, since it's been so long, I used to be a closet smoker. Um, I, from, the, uh, from the East Coast, it's a lot different than the West Coast. You guys, it, it was more socially acceptable here. As a healthcare worker, you would be fired on the spot if you tested positive for cannabis. So, you know, kept it, kept it below the, the radar, so to speak. And then um, when I started doing working, I worked for a private merchant bank. And so we handled all of their healthcare divisions. So we went and ran their pharmacies and their home health and their assisted living. And um, when I was, when I did that, and then I moved into doing cannabis, but at the beginning, I started U.S. Cannabis in 2014. Um, because I saw there was a need um, to, to move forward. But what really got me off the couch, so to speak, is um, there was a guy named Saul Broida. And I've told this story before. Saul is a, uh, he's, he's passed now, but Saul was a patient of mine, 94 years old at the time, wow. U.S. World War II veteran. Um, he was in the Army Air Corps because they didn't have the Air Force. And he was a retired colonel. And he was basically dying of chronic pain. He had uh, pneumonia. It was chronic and he was in chronic pain and he was addicted to opiates. He was receiving care through the VA and the VA, he, I, I saw him one day coming home after an appointment and he said, the VA is kicking him off, off opiates yeah. and he's going through opiate withdrawal at 94 years old. And at that time, cannabis was not legal in the States. And so um, after working with Saul and seeing his medals and realizing what he did for this country, and I'm like, who is going to go out there and help all these retired vets and all these great senior citizens? Because remember, that's my business. I used to work with, I've worked with seniors all my life. Somebody needs to fight for these people. And so I was having that, that come to Jesus moment in the car. I'm like, well, who the hell is going to risk their entire career and profession and do this? And so I went out to Colorado to kind of learn more about it. And I figured I'd get out there. And this is, this is 2013. I was like, oh, they got it all figured out. And they know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> well, yeah. I was far away from the truth. So I realized there was, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't being done. There was, no, there was no consistency of the medication. There was no consistency of the rules. There was no auditing. There was no safety measures. And so I made the determination. I said, whatever it takes, I need to move forward and do this. And so that's, that's how it started. Um, I started working with, with consulting uh, with companies, uh, mainly Indian tribes, because in 2014, yep. the government said they could come out and do cannabis. And so a lot of it was consulting with tribes to say, if you do this, this is what really is going to happen. And this is what you can look forward to, good and bad. And at the end of the day, they decided not to do it because I think a lot of it had to do with uh, Indian tribes trusting the American government. So there's a little so history figured. there. Yeah. So um, that has evolved now into U.S. Cannabis. We're a global uh, general contractor, I try to tell people. So what we do is we have a core t staff and we go out and work with the best of the best in the world, whether it be cultivation, whether it be processing, whether it be a regulatory structure. And we go out and do massive jobs around the world for companies. So one of the ones we're involved in right now, our largest is out of Africa, which is the facility right here called MGMC Lesotho. It's based in Lesotho but it's pronounced Lesotho. And so Lesotho legalized cannabis in 2017. And so um, we were approached last year to do a joint venture with this company, MGMC Pharma. And so within, the, within 12 months, we signed the deal on Christmas Eve last year. And within 12 months, we were the first company to ever ship THC and CBD product out of Lesotho uh, legally. And it went into Australia to a publicly uh, traded medical cannabis company for medicine there. And we've also shipped in product in from Lesotho into Germany, which <laughs> is an extremely hard market to get into. Yeah. It took us almost a year. We, we actually, the shipment arrived about a month ago. And so we currently have uh, right now about um, 500 kilos a month that are scheduled to be uh, starting in February to be shipped all around the world. Now, a lot of that's going to be oil. 
Because yeah, I was going to ask you if, it, if it's if it's uh, uh, flour or, but you just said oil. Yeah. So so what we're looking at it, what we're finding in the global markets is that when you're dealing with cannabis, if yeah. I'm a pharmaceutical company, I don't want to go grow it all. You know, yeah. I just want the base product and then I can use my laboratories to fine tune that oil based product into a tincture, a gel. Uh, we're working with a company in Africa that we're, we're growing their cannabis to convert it into oil. And they they have a specialty design formula for tampons, for CBD tampons for um, that. Also, they're working on a blend for prostate cancer to sell through Africa, through pharmaceutical, through, through pharmacies. And so it's exciting to see how the pharmaceutical world around the world is catching on. And so we're starting to work with companies who deal with API, which is called active pharmaceutical ingredient. Okay. So I, I use the example of um, take opiates. OK, opium is actually grown somewhere in the world to make opiates. And so the number one place in the world is Tans Tasmania, which is not the cartoon, but it's it's the island off the coast of Australia. Australia. And so yeah. most of the opium, what I've learned, is grown in Tasmania, obviously, because oh. it's an island. But they're considered an API or active pharmaceutical ingredient. So any Schedule One product, uh, narcotic, you have to go off this API uh, licensure to where you could ship it to a Pfizer or you could ship it to a Merck and you can send it through normal chains and it won't, it, you know, the customs is not going to stop it and arrest you. So you have their permissions. So we are API out of Lesotho. And so we can ship out this product to pharmaceutical companies around the world to be able to start formulating this product. So our goal here is to create the value chain for the planet, meaning we are partnering with other licensees in Africa to where we can start building up enough product and oil to be able to start servicing markets around the world because we have one of the lowest production costs on the planet. Over, over there. Mm -hmm. And so when you're saying uh, sending it out globally, I'm assuming that you're not sending it here to our the pharmaceutical companies based uh, here in the U.S., correct? Not yet, because the challenge with pharmaceutical companies in the United States is they're bound by either U.S. law or they're bound by the stock market. So yeah. if you're on the stock market in the United States, you cannot be in, the, in uh, doing THC in gotcha. the U.S. now. However, if you're operating in another country Which and, they have, them are, right? and it's legal, yes, yeah. if it's legal in that country, then you could do a study, but you can't sell it. So typically we would, what we, we're currently working on a deal in Italy to be able to ship in a company, uh, so them product that you and I would know who they are, but I can't say them. Um, but they are looking to do clinical trials for COVID dealing with um, uh, anxiety and, and uh, the trauma of having COVID. It's kind of a treatment program for almost PTSD for COVID that's been approved by the government. So, you know, our goal is to, to be able to allow these companies to do their studies but they need to have a place they can trust to get base product that's certified. And that's what we provide. It, it, it's not funny, but I'll say it's, it's funny how uh, cannabis, well, COVID one has probably brought some doors, to, uh, a, lot of, a lot of walls down because uh, being an essential item. And that was one thing they were fighting for here in California for the first few months. Uh, and then they stayed over there. Hey, if, if you're gonna have liquor stores essential, we're right. essential as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the medical Can cannabis here in the state of California has been legal since 1996 and became oh. recreational legal, tw at, you know, uh, 2016, I believe. 2016, yeah. 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 It went into effect in 2018, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it. I see. What are you seeing? And I'm um, what, are you, what are you seeing in the in the international market that, uh, to bring the walls down? Because everyone thinks recreational, recreational. I'm more of a fan of having medical institutions, medical professionals involved, but also passing laws at the medical level. A lot of people in the industry will disagree with me. Um, like in California, when it was become, becoming recreationally legal, uh, I voted no on it. My wife voted yes on it. And the reason I voted no on it is because I've seen what it's done in Colorado, California, Oregon, uh, Washington State. It's literally pushed out the uh, doctors who are working with the patients and the patient like, well, I'm 21 and over. I don't need to go to the doctor anymore. I'll just go down to the dispensary and pick and choose what I want. You know, not knowing that it's a one size fits all, that it's not a one size fits all. You look at age, weight, current health condition, any, any other medications mm -hmm. you may be on. And so I truly, me, I truly believe that a doctor or a medical professional should be involved, especially when you're battling something as severe as cancer, 
mental disorders, um, because you can, uh, it's, again, it's not a one size fits all. So are you seeing the medical market uh, uh, going, uh, getting uh, to kind of legitimize th this industry overseas as well? Or are they just saying, let's make it an open market, let's go recreational? No, it's all medical. It so is. It's huh? interesting. So everybody's yeah. starting with medical, which is good. There's over 40 yeah. countries now where cannabis, medical cannabis is legal. But ironically, the government of Germany just denied a bill to legalize recreational. And the reason that's so critical is what I've learned about, and I've done a lot of work now internationally with cannabis. And there's, yeah. if there's any Americans out there, there's not a lot of us overseas in cannabis. So yeah. great opportunities. Um, at, when, when we can start traveling again, I'm, I'm going to be all over the place. But the, the reason that's important is because Germany is the largest economy in Europe. So Germany has medical right now. And right now they got about 130,000 patients. To put that in perspective uh, on, a, on a dollar figure, last year, the Europe did 250 million in total sales of medical cannabis because there's no recreational. Last year in the United States, between Redical and Rec, we did 13.6 billion. So the, open, the, the world is going to shift over time to Europe because Europe has socialized medicine. So that's your payer source. Remember, I was in healthcare. You got a payer source. A lot of people want it. And you're having that as well as due to COVID and their budgets are going out of control. So something that you and I know, and we talked about offline, people who are on medical cannabis typically decline in their other prescription drugs because they don't need them anymore. Yeah. Well, if I'm socialized medicine and I'm paying trillions of dollars for all my people to have medicine and I can implement medical cannabis and now my drugs per patient or per resident are going to go down from 12 to seven, then I'm going to save billions of dollars. So what my focus is, is my personal focus is to really talk to the legislators to say, look, get past all this ideology bullshit. Okay. Yeah. So let's just be honest. Let's focus on how this is going to help your people economically, but as well, it's going to help them medically and the side effects are next to nil. But, but in, in chasing, uh, changing gears back to the states, when you're talking about medical or recreational, one of the studies that came out of Michigan that said 40% of patients using recreational cannabis are using it for a medical reason. So we consult with a lot of physician practices, specifically here in Florida, as well as other states. And that's a question that comes up all the time. What am I going to do when we go to rec? And I said, you know what you're going to do? You're going to have to innovate. And what I mean by that is you need to start talking about wellness. And so if I'm a physician, and I'm charging $300 for a referral for a patient, I'm not gonna be able to do that anymore because that's too much of a barrier for the average person. Because why? They're gonna go down and say, well, I don't need to deal with this guy. I'm just gonna go into the store and buy and pay 26% tax and I don't care. Yeah. Well, what doctors, I said, doctors, you need to evolve into doing wellness visits for like $100 and it's gonna cover all your blood work every year. It's gonna cover a cannabis referral. It's gonna yeah. cover... All, all the wellness visits or, yeah. or other supplements you should take. And then you can go into that store and now you pay 5% tax or something like that. And you have to make the system so easy that people want to come to you and not to others. And so one of the things that I push, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, they're, they're starting to have what they call ACOs or accountable care organizations okay. in the United States. So basically this is under Medicare. So Medicare is always trying to save money, as you can imagine. And people always use Medicare because that's our socialized medicine. So Medicare has come out with this new program called Accountable Care Organizations, which states that if you're a hospital chain and you end up uh, taking care of all these people through physician, through, through uh, primary care physicians, then you control how much money each patient spends. So if you can save Medicare money, we'll give you half of the savings, which is a big deal. So if I'm in the Bay Area in, in, in San Francisco and I own an entire healthcare system and I'm taking care of, of 15 million people a year and I'm billing Medicare for all their services from x-rays to nursing home to surgeries to diabetic care, and I can decrease that cost to Medicare and I can make an extra you know, $100 million, well, cannabis is one of those factors that you need to start looking at. And so we talk about data. You and I talked about data offline. You got to have that data. So if they start discover, even if you're not prescribing cannabis, if you're noticing, okay, we have 32% of our patients who are currently in our system taking medical cannabis or cannabis, and we're noticing that they're using less drugs. Well, that's not rocket science. Let's start looking at the data. And so I'm, I, my personal focus and my personal mission is to bridge the gap between illegal and legal. 
between professional and not professional to say, look, we're all in this together. Yeah. The stoners brought us to a point, but now we professionals need to help what they've done and we need to take it to the next level so we can start <laughs> doing this country to country. Because to me, the people who are, have been the mission behind this, they always did it for the right reason, but we needed to bring it in and put it in a different language, so to speak. So then everybody would accept it. You know, it's it, 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 we're offline. You said if you don't have haters, you're not doing something right. So you right, might have right. you, you might have more hater, haters on that one after that comment. I probably, but I love those people because what? Because yeah. I, I tell them, I said, look, I need you and you need me. Now, let me yeah. give you a perfect example. So I was on the committee for the first ever World CBD Awards last year in Barcelona, Spain. And so, as you can see, my shirt, I look like, you know, J. Crew or whatever. And a lot of reasons I did that is because I was a closet smoker and they're less likely to search me than they are somebody else. So I was playing a role, you know. So I went over there dressed like this and I was in a room of 20 people and we were all planning this event. And literally everybody started looking at me and basically I said, what is what is everybody looking at? What is the issue? And they said you're like, you should, you don't, you shouldn't be here. I'm like, cause everybody had green hair and tattoos and nose rings. I'm like, look, I'm showing you what I want you to see. Yeah. You know, are you going to, is if I'm in Spain and it's illegal here and if, if you give me a joint and the police come up and I don't have anything and, and, and you have it on you and I don't have it on me, who are they going to search? And they all said, well, they're going to search us. Right. And I go search me. So I said, I'm totally playing all you. And they like, wow. Like, so it was the first time in my life that I've been discriminated against because I did not have a tattoo. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. But I tried to say that and said, look, it takes a village. I need to be on the side talking to all the suits while you need to be to the growers talking about the growers because that's how we get deals done and that's how we move this forward. And so now we understand each other. And so I go fight the battles in the boardroom, so to speak. And they go fight the battles with the local community to make sure we can all blend and work together. Well, well said, well said. And, and like you said, I mean, we're all guilty. I'm guilty of judging a book by its cover, you know, and, and I think in back to even here in our, in our country, talking with the government, you know, um, they're not anti-cannabis. I think they're, they're just tired of the, the, the approach that how people take it of picketing F you screw you. And they're like, who wants to be talked that way? I mean, if I came at you right now, Hey, Michael, F you this, and you're like, Hey, this, this, inter this interview is done. I, you know, I'm not going to, you know, but if you come out and have the conversation and I think, you know, right now we're at, what 35 States at the, at the legal 15 or, 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 or recreation, rec, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and that number year after year is, is going to grow. And, uh, and the stigma is going down, um, doing shows like this. I mean, I think cannabis, there's enough room for everybody in this industry. Um, uh, but I think there's, you know, in, it, in, it, it's, it's, we are talking about restaurant business. You have you, the early bird special that comes in at five, they want to be out by five twenty, you know, five thirty, And then the other group. And I think, you know, everyone worked together to, to bring the stigma down. Um, you we talked about seniors, I can't tell you how many times, you know, we've spoken at retirement communities, senior communities. And I used to ask how many people think the only way to consume it is via smoking. We used to have 85, 90% of the room raise their hand. Now they're educated. Mm -hmm. They are educated. It is a population that it's educated, educated, and they're using it, you know, for sleep, for anxiety, for depression, losing, a, losing a spouse. I mean, a lot of them, I can't tell you how many, how many uh, kids will call me and say, you know, you, you introduced my parents into this. My, my, my father passed away. My mom's been up in the room. She doesn't want to come down. We finally incorporated some cannabis. She's sleeping better. She's off her medications, her confidence, and she's coming down and interacting with, with the, the, uh, uh, her fellow. I, I laugh because uh, uh, a lot of them call them the fellow inmates, you know, <laughs> yes, I've heard that term being in the nursing home industry. Yeah. Y'all can fellow leave anytime inmate. you want. Nobody's going yeah. nobody, to, door's not locked. Yeah. <laughs> so, so with your U.S. Uh, cannabis pharmaceutical research uh, and development company, and it go, and I guess the company is called U.S. Cannabis. Um, I just call it that for short because it's a, it's a mouthful. But the reason, okay. just, you know, the reason I picked that name is because of that exact reason, because yeah. if you take that name around the world, yeah, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. And that was my whole goal was because yeah. 
when I created U.S. Cannabis, it wasn't for when I was starting. It's where yeah. I was going to end up. And so we're on this journey. And anybody in the cannabis space, it's a journey. You're going to have yeah. to go through it. You're going to evolve. It's literally like you're, you're, you're going doing something. You have to be creative every day. And that's one of the things that gets frustrating because there's no, there's no template for this. It's all happening in real time. And so you really have to lean on your experiences and whatever those experiences come from. You know, creative every day. And I mean, someone asked, oh, you've been in this for, for 10 years. I said, I still consider us a startup. I learn every day. We that's are right. creative. I mean, what Crit and I started back, you know, 2010, you know, we've done so much and we've evolved. We've made some great relationships. We've tried, you know, we've tried a different bunch of different things and we keep on going. And I remember one time I was frustrated talking to Corinne one day with all the stuff that was going on. And she said, babe, look where we are now, you know, say four years into it and go back four years when we started. If you could imagine all the stuff we've done, would you be ha happy? Of what? And I said, you know, we've done a lot. And she goes, that's the way we look at it. And so she was always positive of, of staying on our course. Don't uh, let all this other noise bring us down because there's a lot of noise in this industry, a lot of noise, uh, um, you know, not only dealing with, you know, uh, the people industry, but our governments, um, helping, you know, re different regulations. I mean, if we didn't live in a legal state, California, we, it would, the topic would never have come up, uh, about cannabis with, uh, my father-in-law's oncologist. I mean, look what happened with this, you know, saved a life, started an organization, and now we're here helping, helping others at, at all levels too. And so, with the pharmaceutical research, are you dealing with pharmaceutical companies? We are, but not in the States. Okay. So like, perfect example, um, I'll use GW Pharmaceutical, GW Pharmaceutical in the UK. They came out with Sativex, you know, one-to-one -one ratio for MS, 2.75 milligrams of, of each THC and CBD. Legal in what? Six, seven, eight countries, 12. How many countries? Do you know how many countries? Is I it? think it's about 12. But but they're not it's, but that's not legal here in the U.S. for Sativex, and I think but everyone started replicating their 2.75 milligram of both and finding success. And ironically, you say that we're working with a current uh, uh, pharmaceutical company who is doing looking to do that, and again, uh -huh. we're providing the base product because no pharmaceutical company wants to do what GW did is actually grow it all in England go through the hassle. Well, they don't need to. We can make it for them and we could ship it to them, put it on their doorstep with oil, and then they can make whatever formulation that they want. With, with that. And, and, and I think that's that's the way this market is going to go. And I think they lost so much money here in the U.S. And this is just my opinion, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, um, that they said, OK, how can we get it over to the states um, uh, and get involved? And so they've worked with our country. They've changed the scheduling. It's pharma. You can get it now. Prescription, you know, recommendation is is what normally the term is recommending. Your doctor mm -hmm. recommends uh, 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 cannabis for you, but they're able to write a prescription for Epidiolex now for autism and certain different types mm -hmm. of seizure disorders. Um, and so now, I think I don't think they made money on the Sativex, but I think they're making money now. Are you, is that is that? So what's happening is Epidiolex is taking the, taking the lead. I don't hear anybody taking Sativex. So Epidiolex is taking yeah. the lead. The challenge is it's $36,000 a year. That's what they're charging. So what I'm yeah. seeing is I'm seeing some people starting to take it. A lot of times, if I'm in a legal state, say I'm in, in California, and a guy, my doctor said, hey, I'm going to prescribe Sativex, and my copay is $200 a prescription. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to go to the, the weed store, dispensary, yeah. what have you, and say, hey, they want me to take Epidiolex. And the guys will say, hey, I have a full spectrum oil. I can give it to you. It's 60 bucks a bottle. It'll last you a month. Yeah. And so that's what we're typically seeing is because if you look at the long-term data on Epidiolex, after four months, it loses its, um, it loses its efficacy. And I think the, one of the reasons is, is because it's, 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 a, it's not a entourage effect product because they're splitting up the product. You know, it's not a full spectrum. Yeah. And so yeah. because they can't patent, I don't think they could patent a full spectrum. And they did the study off of that. So so to me, Epidiolex was the tip of the sword, so to speak. And so what Epidiolex is playing, in my opinion, is when this becomes legal in the United States, some pharma company is just going to hop them up and buy them for I don't know, six, seven billion bucks. Yeah, that's what they're going to do. And so yeah. that's where we already know. So so we figured, you know, the U.S. law is just too hard right now. So why don't we go around the world and get ready for U.S.? So when the U.S. is legal, 
then we can supply the United States and pharmaceutical companies with as much product as they need because you're going to see this mental shift the minute that the federal government of the United States comes out and says either medical or rec is legal, you're going to see this Im- immense shift across yeah. the entire entire world because you're going to see the stock market go up in cannabis stocks. You're going to see this, this buzz that we saw when Canada went legal. But, but what people may not realize is the American financial sector d- d- basically controls banking around the world. So whatever's not legal in the U.S., if you go to another country to get a bank account, this is what Bank of America did in Uruguay. Uruguay is legal, but they were selling it through pharmacies, and the pharmacies had Bank of America bank accounts in Uruguay, and America said, I don't care that's legal in Uruguay. It's not legal in America. So we're not going to – you can't keep this bank account if you're going to sell cannabis. So that reach is is going past the the country's borders. But what we're finding is – with the new president coming in and the, the shift in thinking, I think you're going to see some sort of movement. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, the MORE Act or the SAFE Act or, you know, fix banking and make it decriminalized. That's all great. But if we're going to legalize this at a federal level, we have to have a plan. Okay? We can't just do like we did with hemp and say, hey, it's legal and we don't know what's going to happen. And, and three years later, the FDA still hadn't ruled on it, you know, what on CBD. So, our goal is to really um, talk to the federal government. And so we have some connections into the Biden campaign and the Biden presidency. We're hoping that they will start listening to us. We want to make this advantageous for all Americans and not just pharmaceutical companies with this gun legal. We want to make sure there's multiple pathways. And one of the areas we're really big on is international trade, because yeah. we need to have trade between America and other countries. For example, Mexico just decided to legalize recreational cannabis and medical. Wow. So that market's going to start taking off in the next year. It's going to be slow, but it's going to start taking off. And so America now is the only country in North America that's not legal. So you're going to start to see this. And I think what you're going to start to see, too, is everybody needs money. These states are dying. The federal government's dying. And if you do, you you follow your history. The reason that prohibition was repealed on alcohol is because the federal government needed money. So to me, it's a perfect time to bring the conversation up. So our goal is to really push this forward. So that way the world can be on notice to say, this is what you need to get into. So anybody who's watching this, who really wants to get into the industry and really wants to to understand it, you need to start now. Don't wait for another two years because you're going to, you're going to be wandering around in the dark for a while. Okay. John did it. I did it kind of finding your way, but now you have people to lean on like me and John and others to kind, of, to kind of help you along your way where John and I, John was before me. I've been doing this eight years. John is like, you, <laughs> dude, you're, you're, the, you're the godfather. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't say that because there are, there, are, there are some real godfathers in this industry <laughs> that were annoyed, that were annoyed when, 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 when I got into this, you know? I can imagine. And, I can imagine. You know, and so, so uh, you know, they've been saying, wait a minute, we've been doing this since, since the 60s. And now all you guys, newbies are coming in here. And so, you know, uh, I met some some real godfathers in this industry, and and uh, but I do have some gray hair in here now from from this industry. I mean, but you know, I've met some great people. I've met a lot of great patients. We work with families and patients. And to us, you know, and I and I know a lot of our followers uh, know my story, and I shared you shared your story. You know, cannabis wasn't our lifestyle, and we were just fortunate that we were in uh, a legal state when. Uh, something as, as awful as cancer was uh, brought into our family with Corinne's father. And, you know, the outcome w- was positive. You know, it, it worked, it saved a life. And uh, to me, uh, to me, the goal is to save a life. And it didn't work with my wife. And so people ask, you know, how, how do you continue with this? How, you know, and it was hard. It was really hard. And then I spoke with a lot of patients when Crin passed, because we've, you know, our, our reach, with the the docu series that we've done, the sh- the podcast that we've done in our co- in our company, but our reach we we've reached uh, 190 countries, but when Crin passed, the love and the outpouring of love and all that from all these people and patients and people that we've talked to and people that watch the show, I mean I had prayer cards sent from around the world. Masses said, uh, uh, "That's awesome." teddy bears, plants would show up at the office, uh, calls and texts and, but sharing their story of how this plant worked and helped them. And it made me really 
get back on the focus saying, wow, to me, success is saving a life. For others, success is getting mom into that nurse, out of that nursing home and bringing her back home because she's able to walk again or she's able to uh, you know, get off her meds or sleeping. Um, I shared this story numerous times with um, uh, this, this wife, her husband. I called to see how her husband was doing. And she said, you know, he passed on Tuesday and I, you know, got emotional. She says, John, you allowed us to get out of the hospital with, with what you did. You allowed he and his brother to have this bond, uh, but you allowed us to up our daughter's wedding by three months. And we had in the backyard this weekend and my husband was able to walk her down and he passed on Tuesday. So for us, it worked. And so that that's what keeps me going and, and, uh, and doing stuff like this to spread, share the wealth of bringing people like you on the show of, showing other parts of this industry. Cause I've never had anybody on the, on the show that, that does what you do. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's not a lot for, of us right now. That's yeah. Tell you well, that. it's not you a lot. You, 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 you're the godfather coming up, you know, I, I don't know, but my yeah. thing is what I want to do is take what you've done and yeah. we got to help more people. So I need to take what my skills are. And, and one of the things that I have a lot of people come to me online and yeah. say what you say, Hey, I really, everybody comes to this industry wanting to work in it and they have a story. And so a lot of times I say, you need to take that, that energy and you need yeah. to take that passion and make it about something bigger than yourself. And totally. then you'll figure out a way you'll figure out how to, how do you fit it? And the number one thing I'd like to tell people who are listening is you have a lot of value in what you're currently doing, even if it's not in the cannabis space. So let me give you an example. So um, I do a lot of Q and a and education through, universities who are starting cannabis programs and one of which is the university of maryland they have a brand new master's in cannabis science and therapeutics is one of the first ones in the world um definitely the first one in america and and their grad graduating class is their first graduating class i think is going to be in this this uh in march right march may whatever yeah, yeah. so yeah. i was talking to their first class it's about 150 people and we're doing this q a and and it john it was the weirdest thing because all the people had advanced degrees Master's in public health, physician, nurse practitioner, PhD in electrical engineering. And these are the smartest people I ever talked to, John. And you know what? I asked a very simple question to every single one of them, and none of them can answer it. You know what the question was? What was that? What are you going to do with this degree? <laughs> none of them knew. So did, well, that's like asking your daughter who is getting her master's right now. Did you ask her that? Get her question? master's in, in international business. What are you okay. going to do? I'm going to work for a bank and I'm going to yeah. go around the world. I was like, as long as I don't have to pay for it, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my answer. But what I'm learning is, it, even for me, is they look at me and they're like, well, this guy's figured it out. He knows what he's going to do. And so what I did is, uh, as I took them one by one and I started asking questions and, and the, the most the most pertinent one, I think, for, uh, for, for time's sake is there's a guy, he was out of Naples and he has a master's in finance. And I said, what are you going to do with this? He goes, well, I can't tell anybody in the finance game because they'll fire me because cannabis is a no-no in the finance world. I said, so what are you going to do? Well, I think I'm going to grow. I want to do a grow or I want to do a processing plant. And I said, why do you want to do that? <laughs> he goes, well, I want to be in the business. Okay, well, yeah. why don't you take your skills in the financial management and reverse the process and then go back into financial management as an expert? He goes, well, I can't do that. I said, why not? Because I would lose my job and everything. I said, you're not thinking the right way. What you do is you go through a recruiter. They don't put your name on the resumes and you show everybody that you have a master's in cannabis science and you have a master's in finance and you work right. in finance for 30 years everything's moving into cannabis and these companies, and I can tell you per firsthand is because I consult with them all the time. They don't know anything about cannabis. So you are going to be having, you, you're going to have a golden ticket because every financial company is going to want you. And he goes, I never thought about it that way. And I said, right, that's what I'm for. So I've been down this road long enough to know how to connect the dots just like you have. And so what my job is, is to guide people on their journey totally. to say, well, from my experience, this is where I see, think, think you need to be because people forget. Can't, when people come into cannabis, they think you can do three things, and you're going to know exactly what I'm saying. You can grow it, you can process it, or you can sell it. For some reason, they don't think there's any other jobs in the industry. 
So my, my role is to say, well, there's a million jobs. You can do this greenhouse. You can build this greenhouse. You can sit there and you can do tech. You can do financing. You can do trade. You can do whatever you're good at, marketing. I get a lot of calls from SEO companies and all that type of stuff, data analytics. So, so it's, it's people are brought to the industry for a certain reason and they want to contribute. And so what I try to do is help them find their path to move forward because another thing that I see when people come hear me speak is, it started happening when I first started starting out. And so if you're learning to get into the business and you want to know how you can start public speaking, go to like, like John said, go to the nursing home, go to these places where nobody will talk to these people, because that way, what are you doing? You're getting in front of people. You're talking about what you're passionate about. And those people don't really care what you're saying. They're just happy that you're there and you're That's talking right. to them. And cause I lived it. I was in the nursing yeah. homes all the time. And so you hone your craft you start figuring out what you're good at. And so I started doing that over and over and over. And so what I noticed is every time I would speak, there would be a line that would form on the side of the stage or whatever speaking. And I kept getting these people who would come and they would say, you know, I don't know why I came today, but something was telling me that I needed to come here. And then once I saw you, I knew that I was supposed to come see you talk. And you know, whatever you're doing, I, I want to be a part of it. And even if I have to work for free, I'll do it for however long it takes. I just need to be around you. And so I would blow it off. I'm like, you know, they're blowing smoke, but it just kept happening and it kept happening. And I'm just like, you know what? There's something that I'm doing right that, that, that is resonating with people. So rather than, than blush it off, I need to hone that skill because everybody, you know, God, the universe, whatever, they give everybody certain skills. And so to me, one of my skills is being able to talk and interact with people and motivate people, inspire people, because I love what I do. And so if I can use that skill, maybe I don't have all the money in the world. You know, maybe I don't have all the connections in the world. But if I can sit there and motivate people to put them in the right direction, to have them go on the right path, then to me, I've done my job. And what I see right now, John, in the industry is people who know need to step up and lead and people who don't need to step in and follow at least for a while until they can get the feet wet and start figuring out, then they can go expand on their own. So what we do is we try to search for those talented people. So as we expand, then I don't have to go and do job placements. I already have on the top of my head, 10 people that I know when we hit this milestone, these people are coming on. And in this country, we're bringing these people on. And so a lot of that is people who took it on their own fruition to come out and contact me and start a dialogue now and not getting paid because I know they're committed and I know that whatever we do, they're going to be on top of it and they're going to benefit. Cause I'm always big about, uh, about trying to help people out with opportunities who sit there and put in the work because a lot of people won't. A lot of people isn't that, isn't that a great feeling though? I mean, uh, there, there's, I won't name, name his name, but there's a, there was a young guy in this industry and he was just always there. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And Crit and I um, shared with him about, he was on the East coast and we said, Hey, there's a great conference that you need to be part of. Um, you know, I'll pay your way and you can come out and it's in Portland. He goes, Oh, that's right up the road for me. And I said, not Portland, Maine, Portland, Oregon. <laughs> you know, so he, he came out and he was just so thankful. So we got him out. And I said, this is someone who wants to learn. And he learned education. Now he's one of the top researchers in this industry, but we were at a conference one time down in Florida and he was doing presentation and he said, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for John and Crin Malonke United Patients Group. And I, and we were in the audience and I was totally that's shocked, awesome, but, I was, but that's awesome. it made me feel good because that's the way I was, I was brought up with my dad. My dad would like, your daughter is, was international business. We lived overseas, but I always watched him, how he would, you know, he was a great motivator, great mentor. And, uh, and, you know, I've taken that skill, I guess, even with, buddies of mine that I was in, you know, in college waiting tables. And, and this guy, he came in from Guadalajara, Mexico, and he was dishwasher to busboy to manager. And he was always a, today we're still best of friends. And he, he always thanks me. Hey man. And now he owns his house. He started a winery down in, in Ensenada, Mexico. That's awesome. He asked me, Hey, you've always supported me in everything that I've done. I need help with some. And so I said, I'll buy half the, the, the barrel and uh, he, he brought his wine, sent me cases of wine. And on the label, he thanked eight of us and John Malonk is on there. And I just thought, wow, that's so cool. Great man. deal. But he all, I mean, that's, that's just paying it forward and helping people and handholding. And so, uh, and I learn every day and I have people like that in my life, 
you know, so I, I, for you to say that, and that's, you know, prior, that's why I introduced you with your energy because, because of that and why I think the people in, uh, uh, at the retirement communities listen to you and, and because of the energy and, and knowledge. And oh, hey, I always had a good time with them. Oh, All, I love what, the elderly. What, I mean, well, I, also, I, what, what the number one thing, John is, is I think you realize this, they're people. Talk to them like people. That's what I mean. Don't patronize. How are you doing today? Did you take your pills? Ask them about world events, even if they don't care, even if they're demented. Yeah. I learned that as a, at an early age. I was working at 23, 24 with Alzheimer's patients. And yep. when you sit there and you don't show general respect to people, no matter if they have Alzheimer's or not, other people watch. Totally. And, and I have to tell you a, a very powerful story. So when I was 23, I was in St. Augustine, Florida, working with a patient and he had uh, 50, he was, he was 53 diabetic coma. My age. I know. Right. You're right. Wow. You don't look it. I yeah. was telling John before the call, he looks like the man he's like 40, but he's like in his fifties because he lives <laughs> in California. That's just how they do it out there. So, but anyway, 53 diabetic coma comes into the rehab nursing home can only blink his eyes. That's it. Six months later, he walks out. Wow. Walk and talk and normal. And I would sit there, work with them every day. We did uh, dress them, bathe them, taught them how to do that, got better. And then when he came to and he could talk back and forth, I had a very frank conversation with him. I said, how did we treat you here? He goes, well, you treated me fine. Because what I would do is I would come in. He's an African-American guy. And I'd come in, put on the urban radio station he liked and be like, yeah, what's up, Big D? How you doing, man? Let's come on. It's time to work. And he would just... You know, you didn't know what he was saying and what he was doing. And so when he came to, he said, you always treated me with respect and dignity. And a lot of the nurses aides wouldn't. They talked about me right in front of my face like wow. I wasn't wow. here. They would sit there and, and not do their job. And so it really taught me everybody's listening to what you say, no matter if they think they are or not. And to give that human decency and respect. And so to me, I do that with everybody I deal with. I try to get back to people. If you reach out to me on LinkedIn, sometimes I get a little slammed. But I try to get back to people. And as we grow, I will have more people come on. I remember when I was running the nursing home, we had 2,500 employees and we had 2,500 patients. And so I would usually oh, get wow. hundreds and hundreds of emails and probably yeah. 50, 60 calls a day. Well, I had to where I had my people would, would sit there and answer my phone when I was in facilities. And because uh, like when I went on the road to our facilities, they would say, well, why, why am I answering your phone while you're in this building? I said, you know why? Because these people need FaceTime. What is that? These people, I'm just a name in Florida. If I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina or Reedsville, North Carolina in these, in these this country towns, they don't respond to you being on your phone and being on Twitter and trying to talk to them. That's disrespectful. So I would try to give these people FaceTime because I was maybe there once every six months. So to me, it's common decency. And I think if you keep that basic premise in the cannabis space, because I go all over the world every day. And the number one thing I can tell you is People are people are people. Yep. Just because we live in a different country, we all want the same thing. We all want our families to be safe. We want to have enough food in our bellies. And we want to be able to, to live the American dream, which is live happy and healthy for our families. And so if we keep that in mind, then you can work with anybody around the world. And that's a good, good uh, mindset to bring. And, you know, when I lived in, in uh, uh, Europe as an adult, you know, my aunt said, you know what, you're a good ambassador for Americans going over there. You know, you're outgoing, you're friendly, you, 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 you've lived different cultures. And so I think taking that and bringing that same mindset to whatever you do in life is, is important. You know, I, I left, uh, I was, I don't, do you have Trader Joe's out there? The yeah, grocery? well, yeah, they're not as many, but yes, they're, yeah. they're infiltrating and everybody loves them. Yeah. So they, you know, there's this guy that I was check checker and the other day I was checking out and he says, what do you do, man? You're always happy. You're always happy. And I said, well, I'm not always happy, but, and I share them and he goes, how'd you know what to do? And I said, you know, I asked that same question to my dad when I was in college, said, dad, how do I know what I want to do? How do I know what I'm going to do? You know? And, uh, you know, it shocks probably, well, it's funny. <laughs> I laugh because I see some friends in high school and college and they're like, Oh, you're in the cannabis industry, you're in the cannabis industry. Nothing, nothing's changed, you know, 30 years right. later. It's right, like, right, 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 right. Well, it's legal now. Yeah. So I, I was ahead of the curve. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, um, you know, but I just think finding what you want to do, but the number, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're happy. And I think that's an important thing. And I've, I've worked with companies that I was miserable, 
You know, this doesn't feel like work for me. I have, you know, I see these emails that come in headhunter. We have a job and I've been on a headhunter site in 15 years plus. And I'm like, man, I'll never knock on wood. I never want to deal with another headhunter. Not nothing against headhunters. I want to be, I would love to do this the rest of my life. And I, and I will, you know, it's, it's, it's something I enjoy doing. I enjoy working with families. I enjoy working with doctors, mm. uh, working with government. I mean, there's a lot of, I'm a health advocate. You know, I, I do a lot in the integrative oncology world. That's not cannabis, but a lot of times a patient will come. I'll say, Hey, Michael, I've seen higher success this route. This is, if it was my, my loved one or me, I would go that one. I think cannabis uh, will work as a band-aid, but for you treating that ailment, right. I would go this way. And it's so, not a cure all for everything. No. And I, in that, and I share that all the time. I go, I never use the word cure and I never want to give anybody false hope. And so, um, you know, and it's, uh, and I'm curious to know about what you're doing in Africa. Are you only doing that in Africa? Or are you doing in other, other, other countries, um, uh, doing grow, grow ops like you have behind you? Because I work with, I've met, the reason I say that, um, two years ago, I was in Florida at a integrative oncology conference and a doctor came in and he was asking me from Africa. And he asked me, how can I get this? How can I get it back to my country? You know, I have a bunch of patients and I'm like, <laughs> well, legally, I don't think it's possible. Illegally, you know, I'm certain you can do it, but be careful. It's, it's illegal. It's, you know, one, getting out of this country, but two, getting it into your country. I mean, I don't, you know, um, so to, I was kind of surprised when you were saying it's, you know, uh, Africa is allowing it. So are they only, so let me ask you, with them growing it in, uh, it, which they, Lesotho, Lesotho. Lesotho, are they able to disperse it to, to their, the Africans also, or are they only out, able to disperse it out of the country? Well, there's no domestic market. So that's what you're talking there, about. There's so, zero, yeah. zero domestic. Zero domestic. Now, in South Africa, they have it, a regulatory structure where you can put it into pharmacies. Now, it's weird in South Africa. South, and, and this is, people need to realize this. Every state in every, in every country, every U.S. state in every, every country is different in laws. Yeah. So you really have to understand where you're going. So the doctor in Africa, Africa is a big place. So there's a lot of countries there. So what we've seen is Lesotho started the game off legalizing in 2017. Then after that, Swaziland took it up. Swaziland's right near there. I had to learn my geography. So South Africa always at the bottom, and then we work our way up. So Swaziland's right there. Now you see Zimbabwe, Uganda, um, uh, Tanzania's looking to legalize. Tanzania. We have licenses. Tanzania? Tanzania? You know what? I thought it was Tanzania, and everybody says, no, you're pronouncing it wrong. It's Tanzania. I was like, Tanzania. okay. Oh, yeah. I, 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 learn, I learn every day. Excuse I, me. I, you know, I, I took the American, you. and I said, no, it's Tanzania. And they're like, look, man, you're not from here. It's Tanzania. So I Tanzania. shut up. So, okay. yeah, yeah, so, so I shut up. So we have licenses in four other African countries, East Africa. And so okay. – um, those countries, though, they're just getting started and they want to do industrial hemp and CBD exports. And I keep saying, look, that's not really a market right now. The Americans got that market. The, the, it's just not there yet. To me, yeah. you need to focus on THC and CBD medicinal products. And so they're starting to listen, but the stigma is real strong there. So the, the, the products we make in Lesotho now are all exported. However, this contract that we're working on with a pharmaceutical company in Africa, a lot of countries are starting to legalize through medical and we can put it into pharmacies in Africa and they're a healthcare company so they can do that. And so gotcha. one of the things we've learned is you need to partner with people who know what they're doing. So do I know the African pharmaceutical market? No, I do not. I don't claim to know the African market, but through what we're doing, what we do is we put out the energy and you know, I've talked about energy. We put out, yeah. hey, this is what we're doing. And then my job is to try to attract those types of people and our people on the ground as well. So we have an office in Melbourne, Australia. And right now that office is to help because we import into Australia is to go talk to the providers because of COVID. We can't just get on a plane and go there. So we work through partners there. We're opening up an office in uh, Milan, Italy, because we're dealing a lot with, with companies in, in Milan. And we also have an office in the UK. We only cultivate right now in Lesotho because it's too expensive to do it in other places. So the main thing what we're working on right now, John, is to work on the international uh, transportation game and the, and the trade game. I call it the new Silk Road because every country you go into has different rules. You know, we exported product from CBD product from Florida to Lesotho as a test run, and it took a month and a half. <laughs> Just a, a simple kilo of CBD crude. Then 
I got samples of CBDA shipped yeah. in from Colombia by FedEx and I had no problems and it got there in three days. Yeah. From Colombia, which you figure they would search it and everything. Yeah, no, kidding, they didn't. Huh? Yeah. And then I, I had hemp that I shipped from the US into smokable hemp into the UK and it was confiscated because they said it was it was too high in THC because they're at 0.2. Zero they just changed it. It was it has been 0.2% and because they wanted to mirror what we're doing over here, they I think they ju recently just changed it to 0 0.3, like just recently. Mm -hmm. um, and John, I, I will agree with you, but yeah. the Border Patrol didn't get the memo on that. Well, I think a lot of people don't realize, like even in Texas, you know, they were kind of like, okay, what do we do here? Do I mean, that was on the on the fence of they have their dispensaries for CBD, but they had the uh, uh, tinctures and other topicals and then they the flower. And my first, I, I was recently educated, probably about three years ago, I was invited to a farm um, in Minnesota that blew my mind because to me, hemp was always like corn for industrial reasons. I'm thinking, how is this really medicine? Is it just everyone just, you know, it's it just jumping on this bandwagon. And when I was invited out there, uh, I was in a grow like it was in, indoor, like you see there. Uh, I think they had about 70, 80, almost 80,000 square feet indoor and a thousand acres, thousand acres outdoor. Yeah, thousand acres. Yeah, about a thousand acres outdoor. And I walked through there and I could have, I, it felt like I was walking up in, in Northern California, the smell the, the hairs, the purple hairs, the, the, the resin, the terpenes blew my mind and it was 0.3% THC. Wow. And so it really educated me going, aha, now I, I see this. And now there's some great companies in here. I wasn't a big fan of CB, hemp CBD companies. Um, you know, now there's some, there are some great companies, uh, USDA certified organic, mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's a, you know, and I, I haven't been, I have not been a fan of what is grown overseas because the regulations are different. You know, hemp is known as mop weed, like you and I mopping up and they pull up all the toxins, all the metals, all the pesticides, uh, unless you're doing it correctly um, by testing and how you're flushing it. And I'm a big fan of test the soil. So soil seed to sale, test the soil, plant the seed, have the product and then, and then make it for it for the sale. And so, um, Again, I haven't been, are you, are you taking that step to uh, bring that stigma down about, um, uh, I guess, internationally grown, foreign grown um, uh, cannabis products? Yes. And, and what we're trying to do, the, the global standard, and because America global didn't standard, get into, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the global standard is now uh, good manufacturing practices, which, but it has to be European Union GMP. So, so we call it EU GMP. Yeah, yeah. So America has regular GMP, but mm -hmm. not a lot of companies have EU GMP. So I'm still searching for the holy grail of an EU GMP hemp, hemp production facility because I can sell that product overseas. Gotcha. Um, I get contacted a lot of times with companies. Oh, I got this flower. I got this. So just, you know, if you're a grower and you're listening to this, the holy grail is 0% THC hemp flower with over 12, uh, hopefully more, 12% CBD. That's what everybody wants overseas right now. And it's so hard for me to find because I don't want to ship 100,000 pounds or right now we got an order for 1,000 kilos a month to be shipped from, from New Hampshire. We're working with a group to Switzerland. In crude or? or, or, or it's or, all flour. And, yeah, it's and all so, so when you run into flour, I mean, temperature changes the, the cannabinoid profile. And the uh, THC content. And if you stress yeah. out the plant, that's why I don't like dealing. That's why I need zero T. So gotcha. I'm putting a plea out. I need zero T. So, so where we are in the industry is just, it's not, there's not the, as much consistency for a, a, a plant and agriculture in cannabis game because a lot of the genetics yep. I talked to, uh, it's funny because everybody reaches out to me, Syngenta reached out to me and I was talking to them and I said, we, we, uh, we have us uh, companies all over the world that we're interested in getting involved. So we're in discussions right now with the largest sweet corn genetic manufacturer of seeds in South Africa to start converting over to cannabis. And then we're working with a company out of Perth, Australia, <laughs> excuse me, that they have it to where they can get the replication of the seed. So theoretically, you can throw these seeds in any field and anywhere around the world and you get the same exact product every single time. Because what I'm learning is the genetics just aren't that stable right now in the industry. You know where your daughter goes to school? One of the scientists there that I've interviewed, 
he has had the mother plant and they 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 uh, took clones off of it and grew them in different uh, parts of uh, the campus or wherever they were and, and but all in Florida and they end up testing them and they all came out with different cannabinoid profiles mm -hmm. even off the same mother so for you to say that about the seeds I mean that that's that's a big thing because you hopefully one I mean even in California so say if I have a tincture that works here in California and and you know I, I run out in 30 days and I go back down I can get that same tincture and it might not work because it could be okay. from a different crop same label same same testing uh, uh, results, but it, but because of the different crop, it's it it's treat it uh, acting differently in my body, and so hopefully it'll be that way. The way the pharmaceutical company here, you know, take this, you know exactly. It's even like going to a Ruth Chris Steakhouse in Florida or in California, or McDonald's or whatever you, you want know, to use the exactly, analogy. Exactly. And, and this is the challenge in the industry, and that's why a lot of companies they just want to start with the oil because. It, they can they can genetically not genetically but they can modify the oil to where it's the right consistency. But wow. the number one issue I have in the industry right now is dosing and, and dosing, yeah yeah and consistency of product. So yeah. a lot of people don't know the endocannabinoid system uh, causes certain people to have different reactions to it. So I may need twenty milligrams, you may need two hundred to get the same effect. Yeah. So it doesn't fit into the Western medicine model. So the challenge is is getting accurate dosing. So when I go around the world in countries that are legal. I have to, to do some market research. So I got to go out to the stores. I got to buy different products. I got to try them out. And 20 milligrams in Vegas is different than 20 milligrams in Florida. And it's 20 milligrams in California. They're all different. Yeah. So if I'm a patient, which I am, and, and I don't want to sit there and, and get high because I got to go do something. I don't want to take 20 milligrams, my normal dose. It's like drinking two beers and you're flat on the floor drunk. We're like, well, there's only two beers, you know? So that's where we have when we bring people in I always you probably do this too i say start low and go slow you know if, if you're like well i don't feel anything well i don't feel anything well that's great yeah because that means you didn't have a bad experience you know so i'd rather you do nothing and then we build you up to where you take too much and you're on the floor and you're like i hate you and why and did you make me do this yeah and i won't do that again right so yeah. i'd rather you say it's nothing and, and another thing i tell people is, is is somebody said well cannabis is kind of becoming boring and i'm like good that it, means it becoming it's, right? it's com becoming boring. Boring. Okay. So I'm like, that's great. And they're like, why? I said, because if it's boring, that means there's nothing crazy going on. Nobody's dying. Nobody's smuggling. Nobody's doing anything. And so that means we've assimilated into society and society has accepted it. And specifically here in Florida, when this law passed in 2016, John, nobody, it was the, the uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Nobody wanted a store every because all this is kind of like California. You had to opt in. Only a couple of places opted in. Now, nobody cares. There's over 300 stores. All these stores have opened up and you don't hear anything on the news about anything with cannabis. And I'm like, this is great. This is wonderful. And people are like, I don't understand why you're so excited because there's nothing going on. I'm like, that's the story. Nothing's going on. So we've accepted this in society. That's what I get excited about. It, it, it is because we have that in California. I know, you know, I don't, I don't want it in my backyard. Let's go, you know, and there's still counties that don't have brick and mortars. The county I live in doesn't have any brick and mortars. Right. Go over five minutes to the next county, you have stores on every corner. Right. And so, um, you know, so, and I understand that if it wasn't, you know, what, what I want, uh, liquor stores in my backyard or massage parlors or, you know, you can't make everybody happy. That's the one thing in life. Everyone cannot be happy as, as we, we've just noticed and experienced with our, with our recent election here. Um, so do you, are you with us ca cannabis? Are you um, helping change laws? Are you helping patients? Are you helping investors? What, what, where, where do you fall into this? Cause a lot of, above. All, All the above. Okay. So I mean, we actually our, our, help our audience. I, mean, I want you know um, our audience uh, is a little of everything. You know, okay. a lot of them are patients or parents with patients from two two years old to one hundred two years old. Uh, the cannabis naive. They you know where do we go? Where do we start? You know. So they're listen. So with um, uh, what would it, so if someone went and looked for you, what would they be looking for? Well, first of all, if you want to find me, you can Google me. It's just Michael Patterson and yeah. just put U.S. Cannabis Pharmaceutical. 
and I'm up to about, I don't know, 12 pages, something like that. Yeah, I'll, have, I'll have all this information here and, I, and I'm not, yeah. I'm not uh, ending this, this talk right now, but I just want to, you know, if, if any of our listeners saying, okay, well, how, how, how is Michael's company or what his offerings are? How would, would it benefit me? But I'm, I'm not a grower. So I guess it really doesn't, but I'm a patient. And so can well, you share? Patience, what we can do is a lot of times think of us as more of a business to business. And so okay. we're not technically in that much in the retail. So to give you an okay. idea, we're talking about laws. We help the state of Oklahoma write their law called the Unity Act. Boy, so that's a crazy. I, I just found out yesterday I was in a call with a gentleman from from uh, Oklahoma and to get a license is I mean, anybody can go get a license. So I'm, don't get many, me started. Don't get me started. So yeah, that, that blew my mind. Yeah. And they said that it was it had more license in California, I believe. It's over 10,000. Right now, uh, Oklahoma has over 10,000 licensed businesses because they wrote a constitutional amendment which passed, which says you cannot put limits on the number of licenses. And the only thing you need to get a license is you have to be an Oklahoma resident. 70 percent of the equity has to be Oklahoma resident pass a background check and pay $3,500. So we knew all that. And so we went into Oklahoma about two months after the law passed and we yeah. talked to all the legislatures, legislator, we talked to the governor's people, we talked to actual, the head of the Senate, head of the house. I got to talk to the attorney general in the state of Oklahoma in his office about weed. That was very weird, but very cool at the same time. We've actually educated the FBI. We educated the FBI on um, federal, uh, what the current statutes are in the United yeah. States what the statutes are in certain states, as well as international trade. That was very cool too. Anyway, so in Oklahoma, we came in, we gave them the regulatory structure that they need to, to, to fix, fix the rest. Seed to sale program, to be able to um, be able to track and trace. And also we recommended doing a cryptocurrency that we currently are working on. It's in the final stages with the US SEC um, to get approved. And if, if once approved, it will be the third one in US history. And so what we wanted to do is say, look, you're gonna have a massive problem here because one of the things that I teach when I, when I do classes is that what I call is the patterns and pillars of the cannabis space in the industry. And so the three pillars are public safety, patient access and commerce. And these three pillars must balance for society and a system to work. So for example, in, in Oklahoma, there's way too much commerce. You got 10,000 licensed businesses. So if you look at the data, two to 5% of the population typically qualify for medical cannabis. So pick a state, usually it's between two to 5%. Well, Oklahoma is a little bit of an outlier. They're at eight and a half percent. Right. So they're over almost 300,000 people and they only have 4 million residents. To put that in perspective, Florida has 22 million people and we have 22 licensed businesses. That's it. So each business, right, is worth close to a, uh, probably about four or five hundred million dollars. Well, it, that was a really a, a backwards. You had to be in the uh, nursery business for 30 years like that. But it's like a licensed nursing man, nurseryman. And you had to be contiguous. Meaning you had to be all 30 years, right? So they didn't write that for about 20 people. I looked it up. There was yeah. 43 people who qualified. And the reason they did that, it was to throw favors. And through litigation, that's why we have 22 licenses. Originally, Florida started with five, and now yeah. we have 22. They haven't had a new application process since 2015 because of litigation. Oh, I mean, that was so backwards to me. It's like, okay, well, no one's been in the business legally for 30 years. And that was a legal business being the nurture, nursery business, mm -hmm. but growing oranges or citrus, like your family is involved in, mm -hmm. or, or roses is a lot different than growing cannabis. I agree. And, and it, that's why I tell people there's no rhyme or reason to a lot yeah. of this. It's usually whoever the lobbyist is and putting together their agenda. Yeah. Now, another state that I like is, is pretty balanced um, is Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania okay. has 25 grower processor licenses and they have 150 dispensaries. So it's pretty good access. There's 14 million people. And right yeah. now they, they, uh, they usually it takes about two years to get up and running in a new state. They were able to do it in about 20 months to have actually products on shelves. Now they're up to about 250,000 patients and they're getting ready to legalize recreational because New Jersey legalized recreational. So now it's unenforceable. Cause all the states that, that connect, are you yeah. going to sit police on every bridge and every tunnel coming out of Jersey? It's just not going to happen. Right. So now the public safety aspect of the three pillars yeah. is not enforceable. So if it's not enforceable, then you have to change the law. And so 
uh, I think Lincoln or somebody said, if there's a law that nobody follows and you have to get rid of it because then you lose the effect of having laws. So it makes sense. So that's why I feel like the cannabis is going to be repealed. It's going to be repealed. Yeah. I, we're pushing to just do medical because we want the states to be able to have recreational and with a divided Senate, I don't think that's going to pass. So let's yeah. let states do rec. Let's let, uh, let's let companies uh, like, like the rest of America do medical. But we're really pushing to get guidelines for Medicare and Medicaid because imagine all the people we could benefit if this was legal through Medicare and Medicaid in, in whatever form that they decide to. I recommend not having flour because convincing a 92-year-old to inhale something unless it's albuterol or some type of uh, breathing treatment. And by the way, I'm working with a team right now that's creating a generic hemp CBD-based uh, albuterol treatment. So where it'll be a lot cheaper than regular albuterol, that is something that can get FDA approval. You know, so these are the things we try to talk to people. But, you know, that's where we want it to, to move. It's, it's the right time. It's the right time for America to step up. Because let me tell you, the rest of the world is passing America on this. And there's a lot of money on the table we're losing. And, and it should. And I talk about this all the time. I had a guest from uh, the UK on the other day and she was talking about America. And I said, it's so funny because over here, we think the rest of the world Israel, Europe, China, Canada, South America, uh, who, am I, who am I missing? Is, Australia, is yeah. Australia is leading the way over us. We're here, you know, just like you're saying where your call, your daughter's college is ranked number seven right now. Where they're seven, you, right, right. You know, in, in the United States. So um, it is crazy. Cryptocurrency, getting in here. And you're doing a lot with banking before as well. Um, um, do you think because this is a cash business mm -hmm. and you know, all the stories that you used to hear before, you know, it, it, you, you coined the, the term of the, of the cannabis industry is boring because everybody thought everyone walked around with duffel bags of cash, sticking it in safes, having, you know, uh, you know, ex special forces, you know, with guns. Which did happen. Yes. That was the legitimate industry 10 years ago, yeah. eight, six, six, seven years ago. Yes. You know, and, uh, um, and the medical side, I could tell you, I don't have duffel bags of cash. I wish I had duffel bags of cash, but, but, it, but it, it with the cryptocurrency, um, do you feel that's going to help uh, legitimize this industry? You take the black market. Uh, uh, I don't say take the black market industry out, but I mean, it, I think the black market industry will always be there. Um, what, where, where, where are you seeing this going? Uh, do you do a lot with cryptocurrency? We or? do. And so, like I said, we've been working on one now for four years. And with our team, they've been working on it for 10. Uh -huh. And so this is the one we're trying to get approved through the US SEC. So, yes, cryptocurrency is the wave of the future, not just for cannabis, but for every industry. And the yeah. reason is you de decentralize banking. Um, it just came out um, through the banking industry that they're uh, eligible to uh, take certain cryptocurrencies through federal law now, as long as it's approved in the states. So you're going to start to see banks trying to put their put their toe into it. But but what I want to emphasize about cryptocurrency is don't think of it as a foreign concept. Think of it as a stable coin or just like using a debit card. Yeah. So the way you're going to see it is and what we want to do is put it in the system to where in Oklahoma, we're going to have a stable coin, which is worth one U.S. dollar. So if you have our, our token is called Paytrax, it's P-A-Y-T-R-A-K and then a dollar sign. So Paytrax is going to be used. We want that to be the most well-known um, um, cryptocurrency in the state of Oklahoma because we worked it out through the, through the government of Oklahoma that any Paytrax transaction, the taxes on that transaction are paid instantaneously. So for state government, when they're usually getting their tax money every quarter in a cash run industry, there's a lot of fraud. So what we wanted to do is protect the industry. So example, if I'm a grower and I'm going to sell 500 pounds, I don't have to sit there and carry the cash duffel bag. I can carry my phone and then I have a QR code and we exchange cryptocurrency. And then yep. I can go down, I can go to my next website and download that cryptocurrency into my bank account. And so it's approved by the state government. And so that's where we feel it's going to have more transparency because to get into our system, they have to verify you personally. You have to put in, um, all your personal information, you have to be able to put in, sometimes you're eventually going to see retinal scans that are going to go in for your crypto. Wow. Yeah. So, and then what you're going to see is you're going to see an exchange. So you're going to see like the New York stock exchange for crypto, because the problem with cryptocurrency is the value of the crypto is not the, the digital asset. The value is the law that stands behind it. So for example, with Bitcoin, everybody's like, oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. 
Well, there's no real law that stands behind it. So that's why people get ripped off. So what we're creating is literally the token, but we're creating the exchange that it will go on and any crypto can come on to where if you, John, you go to a store in, in uh, Riverside, California, and you use your crypto, like they rip me off. Well, then who do you go to? So we would have a 1-800 number and you'd say, hey, these guys ripped us off. We would file an investigation just like a credit card company would. And if we find they rip you off, then we reimburse your crypto. And now we have regulations. So that's where we're getting. And so we're trying to be the tip of the spear in that business right. because it's taken us 10 years um, through our partners to get this approved. We hope to have it done before Biden comes in. This is what they're telling us. So if we get that done over the next two years, you're going to start to see more crypto being used. But view crypto as something to where we want it desperately because let me tell you, when you're sending money around the world and you got to do wire transfers and they don't work or some country they lost it or all this different stuff, I, it takes, it could take weeks. But if you have a crypto and I send it for here to you and you're in a different country and then I could go to an exchange and I can download it in whatever currency I want, because in Lesotho, they don't even take us dollars in their banks. I'm no. like, what do you mean they don't take us dollars? They said, no, so we have to, sh we can't ship a lot of the money into Lesotho because they don't have a way to transfer it into US dollars. So we have to send it to our bank in the UK. We have a bank in the Seychelles. And then depending on where it's going, it's going to be paid in euros. It's going to be paid in pounds or Australian dollars. So w that's where we want the crypto because as an international company, I can send money across the pond and I can do it quickly. But for the average consumer, now yeah. you can get paid through crypto and they we pay you for your data and you get paid in what they're calling micropayments. So think about it as a like a rewards club. So you get a rewards club and you build up crypto, which is cash you can use on your next visit. And so it's going to be very similar to what we're seeing now. It's just getting yeah. this the legal and the digital infrastructure behind the scenes to catch up to where we are and also to get banks to realize you can't cut the banks out totally. Because why? Because they control the government. So if you let them in, then they'll let it come through. And as long as they know they're making money, they'll be fine with it. And so one of the simplest ways I can explain cryptocurrency is think about it as a merchant processor. So if you go to a dispensary and they're going to use this crypto, then the dispensary is going to push it because maybe their merchant process fee is only 3%. And if they go through somebody else, it's going to be 8%. So yes. That's where I tell people, that's where in cryptocurrency, you, if you're the cryptocurrency and they use you, you can make a lot of money on the merchant process fee because it's just like a, it's just like a Visa or a MasterCard. And so that's what people need to understand. It, it, it's going to come out. It's going to be worth one US dollar when it comes out. And the value to the person who owns the crypto is that merchant process fee. So every time you use it, they make money. Do you think... Um... The not being a conspiracy theorist, but also, I mean, you're seeing these banks, we don't, we're shortage of coins. We're not, I mean, we're seeing shortage of coins mm -hmm. and a lot of due to COVID, uh, we don't take cash anymore. I mean, the, the first time pre COVID, I remember I went down to, I was down in, where were they? San Diego last year. And I went into a restaurant um, uh and they didn't take cash. I said, you got to be kidding me. I had never seen that. You know, you don't take cash. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, you think that's where it's going to go? So they can move in digital. And then eventually we'll have our fingerprint and you'll put it yeah. on the little tab, like back to the future. If you yeah. saw back to the future too, yeah. that's what he did. That's how he paid the cab bill. That's coming. Yeah. And then you'll have it to where they'll read your, your, your uh, digital profile. You'll have that on your phone. You'll pay it with your phone. And eventually what you'll do is you just walk up. And then they'll say, yes, that you'll either press it or you just won't even say anything. So it'll kind of be like your easy pass on your car. You'll yeah. have it to where it'll be on your phone. And the minute you walk through the door, it'll automatically bill you. So I see that convenience kind of coming through. And, and again, that's when you're going to deal with fraud. But the good yeah. thing about cryptocurrency is it's immutable, which means you can't fake it. So if somebody comes through and tries to steal it, you know exactly where it went. You know exactly all the details behind it. Our IT team can explain that. I, I've learned in this business, stay in your lane, okay? So I can I, I can give you the overall concepts, but when it comes down to the nitty gritty, I put the right people in uh, yeah. to answer that. But yes, you're going to see more convenience. I think COVID has actually sped that up the same way it sped up uh, on-demand uh, entertainment. Totally. You know, the same types of things totally. um, to do that. So I, I see that speeding up. And I think if the cannabis industry can get behind this and do it right, I think it, they could, they, it could do well. It could bring more people into the industry. We're already seeing this, believe it or not, in the casino industry. So 
Casinos want to bring in crypto because it'll bring in a younger clientele, specifically in Oklahoma, because the average age of gambler keeps rising. Well, if you don't bring in the younger people to gamble, then you're not going to make money. So if they can bring in the crypto. So our goal is once it's approved, we'll start in the cannabis space and then we're going to move into the regional um, casinos. And then the goal is Vegas. It's kind of scary because, you know, with with COVID now and, and having PayPal and Venmo and all these things, it's like you don't have the, the you don't. You know, we knew we knew the strength of a dollar as a little kid. You'd mow lawns, do your paper out, you know, whatever. Oh my gosh, I have this. And now I can't tell you how many things I buy. Click, because your all your information is stored. So it doesn't affect me the way it would affect me, like having a hundred dollars and now I have eighteen dollars in my hand. It's like, oh, you know, and so now um the thing with uh PayPal and I'm and and I'm and I'm still learning cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I'm not, I mean, I'm here. I'm not even halfway understanding. But the thing that frustrated me about <clears throat> PayPal is that they froze our accounts uh, a few years ago. I think I remember Corinne was going through her, her cancer treatment and they froze our accounts and we didn't, sell, we don't sell products and we, but we did conferences and our conferences would do that. And they, nope, nope. And they, and I had to sign, I had to, I had to write a letter and I spoke with a guy I said, this is completely wrong. You know, we're not selling anything. We're doing a conference that we're not selling products. You're selling information because the well, same thing happened to me. So I had to sign this McCarthyism form. Yes, I'm a communist. I have broken your law. I am using, I, I am a, a illegal, a federally illegal company, you know. And I said, you know what? I'm done with PayPal. I'm done with it. I'm even taking my personal stuff. But there's another company out there called Venmo which everybody in the cannabis industry is selling their, their, their products to. And mm -hmm. it's another online owned, yes. owned by PayPal. Right. And I shared that with the guy. I said, you guys are driving, you know, I'm holding back my adjectives here, but I just said, it's, it's bullshit is what I said to him. in some other words on, you don't, because of PayPal, but, but we, we're not going to accept cannabis over here, but we're not going to, we're not going to really punish anybody if it's over here, but it's still our company. And uh, I think that's a big frustration. So I hope this, this cryptocurrency can come in and change some things and, and legitimize this industry. I mean, like I said, you know, this, this is a true industry. Uh, it's a, uh, what do we call it? An essential business. Um, essential service. You know, yeah, it's, it's, I agree. But I got to tell you, though, your bad experience, you paved the way for me because I came out in two, 2016 with PayPal. Yeah. We were doing conferences across uh, Pennsylvania when they legalized. Yeah. They cut me off, but they said, if you, I said, look, all I did like you, all I'm selling is information. Yeah. I said, okay, well, if you can send me the contracts that you had, because we did them at Marriott, send me the contracts and show me what you're doing and then we'll approve it. So for me, you paved the way for me. So thank you, John. I appreciate it. So I showed them that and they let me keep going, but they had a, like 130,000 of my money just yeah. sitting there and I couldn't yeah. touch it. And so yeah. I, I sent them that. And so I think they finally gotten on the bandwagon. Oh, and so. You, so what you're saying is, is what I've dealt with is tip of the spear stuff. Like we were the first people to advertise in, in Hawaii about cannabis on the radio because we were doing uh -huh. a seminar. They had to go all the way to the corporate, the top of the top to approve it. And I kept telling them, we're only providing information. There's no free samples. I hate that joke. Everybody, oh, you got any free samples? But uh, you know, we, every time. We would get that at the retirement communities. Where oh, are yeah. samples? Oh, where are yeah. samples? No. No matter no. where I am in the world, yeah. that's the number one question. Yeah. Oh, you got yeah. free samples? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have any. I got paper. You want to have paper? You want to learn about it? That's not fun. And then another that's thing funny. I noticed, when we go in and do seminars in different states, it's it's when the state legalizes, I got to tell you this. So you're sitting there, and I just sit back on a fly on the wall when everybody's coming in and watch the room and, Everybody's so excited. Oh my gosh, I'm going to do marijuana. This is going to be great. I've been thinking about this all my life. And then we start in with the rules and then we start in with the regulations. And then by the end of the day, they're like, oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, but look at it this way. Now you know exactly what you're up against. Yeah. And so one person said, well, you guys just crush a lot of dreams. And I said, no, we actually, what we do is we make them realistic. Yeah. And then people want to move forward. Um, they do. And we're lucky. It's certain it's each conference we've done, somebody in that conference usually gets in the business. Every, it's happened every time, which is great because we feel like we need to sit there and tell truth. Like you're talking about, yeah. this is the truth. 
if yeah. you want to do this, be ready because if I'm going to train for a marathon, I'm going to go find somebody who's done the marathon and say, what is it going to take? And I'm going to do exactly what they're going to do. And so that's where I think we are in the industry to say, look, this is what you're going to expect, just like you do with the other patients. Everybody needs somebody to lead them in the right direction. And so that's why I feel like you and I are doing and working together, we can help more people. Well, I, I plan on working together with you and, uh, right. and, and there's uh, throughout this whole conversation, my mind is like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. Michael will be a perfect thing with this. We're doing this. God, Michael will be a perfect thing to do this. So let's continue this topic, uh, conversation going. And sure. uh, I'll send you some emails of, of what, um, you know, I'm working on, but I think it would work directly there. Um, uh, where it could help me and it could help you on, on, sure. on a few of these things too. So, um, so let's, I can go on for hours with you as we've me already. Me too. You know, so, yeah, we got to cut it sooner. Like, yes. People are like, come on. Um, what, what, uh, what can you share for our audience that you see in the future? I know you've, you've said a few things with the cryptocurrency and laws and stuff like that. You know, I hope it has, you know, before all the laws change, especially in Florida, um, it, if we didn't live in a legal state, Corinne and I and her family, her father would not be alive today. Mm -hmm. And there's a story of a gentleman that is, he's a doctor in, uh, in Florida. And he called one day, and this is back in, I want to say 2011, 2012. And he said, Hey, is John Malanka there? I go speaking. He goes, I'm reading your press release. Is it real? Is this really real? And I said, it is real for me, but this is what, what was going on. And he started crying. I said, what's wrong? He says, I'm a doctor in Florida. My wife has cancer, brain cancer. I don't know what to do. And I would love to try wow, this. Sweet. And I shared with him what I would do. And what I would have done is fly to a legal state, obtain, become a legal patient, obtain it legally. How you get it back you know, to you is up to you. I'm not advising you to break the law. So about a couple of weeks later, he calls me and he says, Hey, John, you remember me? I said, of course I remember you. And he goes, I just want to let you know, I you did exactly what you told me, what I, to, what I told him to do, how to become a legal patient, not to get it back to him, but legal patient on coming out here as, as you, you did as well, bring your California or U.S. birth certificate. Right. You, you know, go down to the DMV, get a, get a, get a uh, uh, California ID, um, meet with a cannabis doctor and then obtain the medicine. And anyway, he did all that. So over the next few months, he would call and text and email. We had a relation. One day he called me and he said, I'm leaving my wife's um, oncology appointment right now. And you're our first call. She has clear scans. I'm crying. He's crying. And he says, awesome. You, yeah. He said, will you send me a picture of you and Corinne? Um, because I, when my wife, uh, I would like, like to show her a picture of this. And he goes, and he wrote me the nicest letter that said, uh, you've allowed, you allowed us to this, you allowed us to cut this, this cell malfunction off of the knees with the information you said, what you shared. And I'm going to show this picture, you and your wife to my showing that these, the, these are the angels that put us on this journey. Awesome. And that meant a lot. And so when I talk to patients that live in illegal states, Florida used to be one, California or, or Texas used to be one, Oklahoma, I mean, right down that everywhere, you know, it was only, it's only become legal medically in some states and some states cancer is not a qualified condition. Whereas hiccups, hangnail, you know, uh, and epilepsy is, and it just, and it frustrates me. So I, what you're doing spreading this out, not only here in the U S but globally helping patients, because I think once I don't care what your, what your, uh, stances on, on cannabis or anything else, cancer and illness will, will, and does affect us all in one way or another. If it's, hope it's, it's all not. about the wellness and how people feel. And to me, how people feel that's taking away from our, our economy and helping us grow, not as just as, 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 as uh, citizens, but as humans. And so, to me, that's why I say cannabis is going to change the world. And so that's what our mission is, is like, like what you're talking about, helping individuals. My job, I feel like I need to help create the infrastructure. Yeah. So when people do need it, it's going to be available because the big problem we see now is, is if people do want it in these countries, one, they can't get it. So by the time they legalize, we need to have a way to put it on the shelves quickly. 
And then that way it can be used because even if the medicine's great, if they can't access the medication or if it's too expensive, if it's $900, I remember when, who was it who legalized it? It was here in Florida. I think it was, it was like $800 for a a little bottle. I mean, it was just crazy. Nobody could afford it. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do is, is the medicine's no good if you can't access it. Totally. Totally. And that, that runs into us all the time, which, which is some of the things, you know, I'm looking, I'll talk more about, but it, that, that will help a lot of patients and a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, grow operations like the one behind you, you know, the, that they don't have access to what I'm talking to right now, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with uh, offline. Um, I think that's it, my friend. It's a great show, dude. So, I love so, it. And, yeah. And then- so, so how can, uh, I want to get you back on as well. Um, sure. You know, when I wanted to talk to you about, I mean, what, what can you leave our audience with? I know you, you touched up on that. Um, how can they find you? Um, are, I know you're a privately held uh, consulting firm. Will you ever go public? Are you looking for investors? I mean, what, what, what are you looking We're for? We're always looking for investors. The yeah. challenge is, is a lot of our investment is in the MGMC, which is the company behind me. Okay. Uh, so our, our website is mgmc-group.com. Okay. And so if you want to take a tour of this facility, it's actually um, online on our, on our website. And then, um, so we're always looking for investors. I, I always tell people though, right now, we are only needing investment in outside the United States. So if you're comfortable investing outside the US, we're all for it. Um, we will go public with MGMC probably in two years. I'm actually one of the, uh, I'm actually the president on the executive board. So I will help steer the company. Will we go public in the States? It depends if it's legal probably either in the UK or in Canada, depending on the, the, the type of the markets. So, um, and then to get a hold of me, LinkedIn is probably the best. It's just a Michael Patterson, US Cannabis Pharmaceutical, and I should come right up. Um, yep. I accept everybody because my job is to educate. Um, our, our corporate website for US Cannabis is just USC, P as in Paul, R as in Randy, D as in dog.com. So USCPRD.com. Awesome. which is a very complicated thing, which is the first letter of each, uh, each word in our name, which is U.S. Cannabis, Pharmaceutical Research and Development. And so uh, with that, and then also, if you can't find me there, just do on Google, Michael Patterson, U.S. Cannabis, and it, it comes up. So, and I'll, I, and I'll, put, I'll put all your stuff on, on okay. uh, you know, and so uh, I don't know if you know, but we'll have the video for our podcast. Right. Uh, we're on uh, BuzzFeed or Buzzsprout, whatever it is. And I think we're on 18 mm-hmm. channels from iHeartRadio to Apple, to Google, to uh, Spotify and et cetera. And then we do a transcript of this as well. So, but. Uh, and then we're going to, and you reminded me of that. So we're, well, I'm starting my first podcast called the Cannabis Report with Michael Patterson. It's going to start in January. So yeah. I encourage me to follow me on LinkedIn. And then yes, I'm going to be pushing over um, to have that. And I definitely have John, you're going to have to be on the show. We're going to have a great yeah. time. So I can't wait. We're going to shoot the shit. We're going to have a great time talking about the different issues um, and definitely getting your perspective. So yeah, the cannabis report with Michael Patterson will be coming out in January. So definitely I encourage you guys to uh, check that out. We we will, uh, we'll promote that for you as well. And uh, Michael Patterson, CEO of U S cannabis pharmaceutical research and development LLC, also known as us, us cannabis. Keep it simple. Yes. Keep it simple. And, uh, Blessings to you, your family. Congratulations on your daughter, what she's doing. And uh, maybe she'll follow in the footsteps of her dad. What is, speaking of I which. I don't know. Uh, no? I said, no? I don't know. Right now, she thinks it's kind of boring. I'm oh, like, it's okay. Like, like the rest of America. Right, too. right, right. Exactly. exactly. And, and, and for everybody uh, out there as well, uh, Mike's a, uh, a twin. So you have, you have your brother that's, that's coming and in, in getting He's involved. going to be on the show as a producer, identical twin, and he used to be in radio. So he's going to awesome. be doing the producing, which is great. Good team. Good team. So Michael, thank you very much. Uh, wishing you the best and, uh, and uh, looking forward to do more things with you as well. Thanks, John. Yep. Everybody, John Malanka, hope you enjoyed this. United Patient Group, be informed and be well, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to Be Informed, Be Well with John Malanka. Be Informed, Be Well is brought to you by United Patients Group. Come and visit us at unitedpatientsgroup.com. Hey everybody, John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be Informed and Be Well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA, that's right, USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. 
and all of its hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. It is a family owned business and is deeply committed to the science of providing only the purest hemp and CBD products for the best results and most beneficial experience. Its mission is to bring the therapeutic value of pure organic hemp and CBD to people who seek supplemental relief through the use of healthy natural products. Aspen Green is free from toxins and runs up to eight different lab tests from bona fide third party labs throughout its product line. It holds in high regard three foundational principles that guide every aspect of their business, actions, and interactions with their customers, partners, as well as their community. These are quality, integrity, and transparency. These will always remain at the hearts of their efforts to bring their beneficial products to consumers. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPG CBD for 20% off. Again, UPG CBD for 20% off at aspengreen.com.